um, I came out here actually uh, from New England uh, to work for Amazon. And uh, it was one of my first experiences in the Pacific Northwest. It was wonderful. Uh, I got to meet my wife out here. Um, and I did a bunch of work on things like reputation systems, you know, figuring out what the best, most trustworthy people are so that when you get those reviews on Amazon, they give you the right reviews. So I worked on that for a little while. Um, I did a little stint at a startup, and then I went to Google, where I built things like um, Google Pack, which is a funny little product. Um, I shipped things like Google Apps, um, and ultimately we ended up working on Google Hangouts, uh, which was one of the last things that I launched before I left. I also did some work on Maps and some other things. I can talk about those, too. Um, and throughout this process of working on this, uh, and I decided that I wanted to go do my own thing. And so I started my own company, uh, Scaled Recognition, and we do some very interesting work now around image um, analysis, trying to figure out what uh, an image actually contains. For example, if it's a picture of a person, who is that person? Or if it's a picture of handwriting, what does the handwriting say? And in the course of the process, I wrote a book called Shipping Greatness, which is actually about how to build great software. Now, it's more for you know engineering types. Um, but it was a, sort of an interesting process to sit back and think about what was it that got us here? Because those of us in industry kept on sort of reinventing things every day. And it was really, really interesting to sit back and think about that. So that's sort of how I ended up getting introduced uh, into this, this uh, Pacific Science Center, Science Cafe, through a friend of mine. Uh, and really excited to be here to talk about it. So let's talk a little bit about software and sort of what goes on. Um, it's a huge topic. Uh, probably many of you know somebody in this industry um, or know some large amount about it. My opinions are just my opinions. So, you know, I'm very easily wrong. You're, you're welcome to, you know, disagree with me and provide your own. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you'll be just as right. Uh, but uh, let me give you some sort of framework to think about this. And the way I think about it is that software is like a war. And what do I mean by that? I mean that there are a series of roles, okay? They're the folks who figure out who you should go to war with, right? That's, that's those guys, right? They figure out who are the baddies and who are you going to go fight. And then they go to the generals. They say, okay, you got go, you got to go get these guys. And the generals go and they figure out how they're going to go to war. And they're going to rally the troops and they're going to get the troops together. And then the troops are actually going to do the heavy lifting, right? They're going to go do the hard stuff and, you know. There's attrition, and you know sometimes there are casualties and things like that. And it's not a laughing matter in, in real life, but in software, this happens all the time, and I'll tell you about it. And then there are folks like the MPs, the military police, who try to you know make sure that the uh, the actual troops stay in line. Um, and uh, you know there's other support organizations like defense contractors who do things like provide logistics and feed the troops and stuff. Okay, so why do I say this is true about software? I'll tell you why. So first of all, there's a role called the product manager. I was one of these guys for a while. I was a product manager. Sometimes you hear them known as called program managers, project managers. Um, the traditional product manager role actually comes from uh, physical goods, where somebody would do brand management. They would do things like, you know, figure out what color the Tide box should be. <laughs> In software, uh, a product manager figures out what to build, what do customers want. They go out, they talk to customers, and they say, what do you want? Oh, OK, you'd, you'd like it to be faster. Great, we'll make it faster. So they figure out where you should go. Project managers do that to some extent. They also try to keep the team on track. Program managers do a little bit of that. But they're more focused on helping the team sort of function well, more of a glue and grease role. So as you hear these, these different titles, you know, you may hear them around somebody say, oh, I'm a program manager at, at Microsoft, or I'm a product manager at Google. They do sort of similar things, but they're a little bit different depending on where they are. So these are the folks that are responsible for not building what you want or building what you want, depending. <laughs> OK, so then there are the bosses, the generals. These are frequently engineering managers. So as much as the product guys are like, ah, <clears throat> I got my, my suit, and I, you know, I got my fancy Thomas Pink shirts, it's really actually the guys in the sweatpants and the gray hair that actually run things. You think I'm kidding. No, one of the, one of the great uh, engineering directors of this area, actually the guy who runs the Kirkland office, he's the site director, Chi Chu, um, he's a really wonderful guy. Uh, he was once this close to not being allowed into a restaurant in Sweden because he wore sweatpants with stripes on them. 
And, and eventually they, they had to sort of like stand in front of him to like let him into the, into the restaurant. Chi is a brilliant, amazing guy, but you know, he wears sweatpants and he doesn't comb his hair. The thing is, is that these are the guys that organize all of the troops. They inspire, they direct, they inform the way that things are built. Okay? So when you meet an engineering director or an engineering manager or an engineering VP, they're working directly with the troops, the engineers. I mentioned attrition. So here's what happens when you set a bunch of troops on a mission that like, you know, isn't going to go particularly well. They quit and they go away and work for another company, right? You put a whole bunch of people on Longhorn at Microsoft, and Google sets up a shop right in Kirkland because they're like, wow, this is great. We're going to be able to hire all these people that have been working their butts off, and the project was a real pain. Um, and honestly, some of the most wonderful, amazing engineers I knew came out of that project. It was pretty painful. Um, but they were wonderful, wonderful engineers, uh, and there's a lot of great, great science that got done there. So, so then you've got, so those are your troops, um, and there's various levels, and sometimes, you know, those troops become uh, leaders, and they become the managers and so forth, just as you would see in the military. And then you've got folks like the test engineers. These are the folks that keep the software engineers in line. They write the tests to make sure that things happen. So when you hit a bug and things don't work really right on your computer, and you're like, what's going on here? Well, it meant that somebody didn't quite keep the engineers in line. Things are changing a little bit, though, now. In the old way of doing things, there were a lot, basically, the engineers would build things. They would throw it over the wall. So the way this would go is, uh, in, in the old school, um, you would work on your plans. You know, guy, guy A works on his plans. And he says to the guy next door, he's like, OK, I'm, I'm, done with, uh, I'm done with mine. He would throw it over the wall of his cube, throw the document over. And the guy at the cube, he would take things over, right? This doesn't happen anymore because it, we stopped being able, as an industry, to hire test engineers. Well, why, why is that the case? Well, OK, so we would get these, you know, we'd get these fancy pants software engineers, and they would play their video games, and they get paid a really nice salary, and then we'd say, OK, so we don't think you're a software engineer. We think you're a test engineer. So we're going to pay you about 80% of what that other guy made, and we're going to sort of you know, ask you to punch a bunch of buttons for a while. And the test engineers go, wait, I can do the same thing. I should be a software engineer. So they would become software engineers. Next thing you know, there are no test engineers because they all want to be software engineers. So we invented a new way of doing things. It's called test-driven development. So now most software engineers write their own tests, and they make computers do the testing. So you don't see a lot of tester, testers anymore, but the ones you do see, if you find them, you find, see a test engineer, they're probably really sharp uh, because they've decided that this is their passion, and that's really great. Uh, it's, it's just a real, it's a real pleasure to work with somebody that's really passionate about that type of stuff. Finally, you get folks that are the support roles. These are the people that, you know, you're just blessed to know if you work in this industry and are always stretched way too thin. Folks like user experience designers. These are people that design how your product should work. What, and I'm not just talking about what the button should look like, but really, should you have one button or should you have three buttons? That type of thing. These people always work on many different products at the same time, so, or, or you know, many, many smaller projects. So they, they have a broad array of experience, really fascinating people to talk to. Similarly, folks in product marketing, uh, they're gener they generally work across many different areas and so forth. Um, and so you'll see, when you look at these support roles, a broad array of experiences in them. OK, so these are sort of like the seven people you meet when you go to heaven in software. And if you're lucky, you know, they'll all be nice to you. More often than not, they just will have sort of mediocre social skills. And, you know, you'll just have to stare at them quizzically for a while. But eventually, you'll figure it out. And uh, it's a very interesting group. Um, the, the one thing you will learn, uh, and, and this is a tip uh, when, this is, this is my top tip for this slide. If you're dealing with folks from the software industry, remember, they tend to see things as pretty black and white. Okay? They work in software. It either works or it doesn't. It's either on or it's off, right? So if you're like, well, it's not entirely like that. It could go the other way. And they look at you and they say, no. <laughs> it's, it's just the way they're wired. OK, so who decides what software to build? This is, I, I, I think it's important to, if you talk about those people, how does it happen? Well, is it just the product managers? The answer is no, not just the product managers, because ideas come from all over the place. So some, yes, they come from product managers, but others come from the leaders. Okay, So this is where you get guys like Jeff Bezos. One of the first products I worked on when I came out here, I showed up in 2003, walked into Amazon. They're like, Jeff has this product. I'm like, Jeff? You mean, you mean Jeff? They're like, yes. 
you're going to have to go meet with them in like a week. It's called Real Names. You're going to ship it. I said, you're kidding me, right? So Jeff wants to go make sure that every reviewer is going to write a review on Amazon with their real name. This is going to be Jeff's product. Oh, my gosh. Okay. So some ideas start this way, just as some ideas start with Steve Jobs or some ideas start with Larry Page. For example, you know how on Google many of the buttons are red now and it got that new user interface for those of you who use Gmail. It's all, this is Larry Page who just said, we're going we're gonna to make things look better. We're going to make them look nicer. So some ideas do come from the leaders and they drive things. Not all that many, though, um, because a lot come from the folks that are closest, the sort of product managers and engineering managers. And then some do come from the engineers, folks who say, you know, I really care a lot about this. I'm going to try to build a prototype and convince a bunch of people to make it happen. And they drive it from the ground up. This happens less and less and more with sort of smaller projects, but it's a great way to see things happen. You also see in some companies, um, I, I think you see this to some extent in Microsoft lately, some things coming from the competition. And you see this also in Google, uh, where you see like Google Plus where you see a lot of following Facebook, right? You're coming from the competition, you're, but then you're going to try to do your own thing. Like we put Hangouts, when I was at Google, in, in Google Plus as a way to do something new on top of Facebook. So competition does drive things, and ultimately, so do customers. You know that real names thing I mentioned? Well, it turned out when we actually mentioned it to customers, they said, are you kidding me? This is terrible. People will attack me. And you know they were basically right because you know these people are basically spending their time writing horrible reviews about people. You know, and if somebody just has their book out there now, I can understand that this is a terrible thing for you as an author. So it, it's very interesting. Those same reviewers came to us and they said, "This is a terrible idea. Please don't build this." And we changed it uh, because they gave us a better way of doing things, and that was good. That was good. That's the way to do it. Okay, so that's who decides what software to build. Let's talk about how things happen. Now I'm going to take a very complicated, convoluted, extraordinarily painful sometimes process and walk you through just briefly how people make things in the software industry. First, you get this idea. Somebody's got this idea. They say, you know, let's make a hangout. Let's make a multi-way video product. Okay, this is interesting. You buy a bunch of companies, three years go by, nothing happens. This is literally what happened, actually. What, what happens after that is that you get some, you got to go and take this idea and get some buy-in from some people. Basically, some generals have got to sign up to actually go take that hill. You know, if the CIA comes in and says, this is, this is the place we got to go get, then the generals have got to say, well, okay, it's gettable. There's plenty of generals who say, you can't take that hill. Are you kidding me? It's good to listen to those guys. At the same time, uh, sometimes you got to do it. So you get them bought in, and it's, at this point, it's just a conversation. There's nothing really real there. So then what you do is you find yourself a designer or somebody that can make some drawings. Because it turns out that pictures are how people get aligned. This is like a life lesson, right? Draw a picture and all of a sudden people pay attention. I don't know what it is, but you know, you can, you, she, heads are nodding in the back. This is good to see. Um, yeah, no, you draw a picture, people get it. Uh, this is why those support roles like design are so important. So you get these pictures together. Now people start getting this idea of how it's going to work, how it's going to look like. One of the things that, that uh, Amazon pioneered was the idea of writing a press release before you build a product. So the idea was, if you can talk about what it's going to be like when you launch it in a way that's really compelling and you feel like, wow, the Wall Street Journal would totally write about this, then you've got something that's really meaningful. Also, you figured out how to say it in a really short, concise way, and that means you'll actually be able to pitch it to Jeff. And then you can build it. That's right. Okay, so then at this point, now you can actually get real buy-in. Because people, when you just sort of had this idea, they're like, yeah, okay. This guy over here thought, okay, I think he's going to build a blue cat. And the guy over here said, well, I think it's actually a purple dog. You know, and between the two, they figured out, oh, it's a koala bear. <laughs> so this is when you get the real buy-in. Because now you get a picture of the thing, and they're like, oh, that's a koala bear. That's cool. Okay, great. Let's build a koala bear. Now that you've got people bought in, you've actually got some people that are going to start working on it. So you've got to have some requirements. This is where your program managers come in and your product managers come in and your tech leads come in. These are sort of your senior engineers. They figure out how it's supposed to work. How is, you know, what's it going to look like? What are the little bits going to do? What are the error messages going to say? What happens if you don't have an email address? I, don't, I, don't, I can't even imagine what would happen now. My head is exploding in the, as I speak, but still. People have to think about this. Um, and so you figure out the requirements. 
Then when you've got those done, you hand them off to the engineers who never look at them. Because everybody's paying attention to the mock-ups. I kid you not, this is true. You have an engineer? OK, good. Yes. No, this is true. I, I'm an engineer, and I've also been a product guy. It's true. You never look at them. But the process of writing them down is super meaningful. You know, it's like, it's like saying your vows when you're married. I'm married now. I'm, I'm happily married. Um, the process of saying your vows. Maybe you don't remember your vows every day, but you said them. So that means that they got in there somehow, and you, you didn't remember them. So now you get to do the hard stuff, the development. Right? And you're going to build things, and you're going to discover that there are lots of things you did not remember or think about. That's cool. This is why you got your sharp you know, team. This is why the, the troops on the ground get to make some decisions as they go along, and they get to have some ownership. So you build the software. You figure it out. You make adjustments. It's not over yet because there is some testing that's involved. Um, sometimes the engineers test. Sometimes testers test. Um, sometimes you can, you know, vend it out to other people. But what gets really interesting, once you think things are basically working, you find out that you're wrong. They are not basically working. And what you do is you put them into trusted testers. So many of you have had strange experiences on websites, I'm sure. You've encountered something on Amazon where all of a sudden, like, the home page looks weird. And you'd be like, how do I find apparel? Where did, what, how, where did apparel go? Or you suddenly notice some strange feature, and you're like, wow, I really like that uh, you know, people who bought this ultimately bought that feature. That's really great. And you're like, why is that gone? Well, it's because it's in a web lab. There's a thing called web labs at Amazon. It's very simple. They put stuff on the home page. They put, them, put things on pages randomly. And then if people buy more when they see that random thing, they keep it. If people buy less when they see that random thing, they don't keep it. Very straightforward. It's nice when you actually make money, you know, as a company. You can do that. It's much harder when, you know, you've got something like a word processing program. And you're like, well, I don't know. Should I put the button over there or over there? You try to test it, but really what you do is you give it to somebody, and they say, I think you're an idiot for putting the button on the right-hand side. It belongs over there. What, are you kidding me? And then you, you take that back, and you're like, all right, how, how do we think to put it on the right-hand side? That's, that's what happens. You bring it to the users. Users tell you. Um, I actually talk about this as really testing on users, um, and uh, this is considered anathema, but I think it's really true. Uh, you got to get real people to tell you what's wrong. You lose your perspective. Finally, you do field trials, and this is when you really roll things out uh, into broader usage, and, and real people start trying things, and things scale, and they go up, and they go down, and you get things like Gmail is in beta for five years or something like that. You know, at some point, it basically stopped being in beta. There were a series of things, though, that the company felt were really important about that they needed to do before they felt like they could say, you know what, we can take that label off. It's no longer a field trial. And until those things were done, those things were, you know, some very resilient backup systems and so forth. Um, they didn't want to take that label off. And that was totally reasonable. So that was the field trial. And then it became the real thing. Uh, and that's sort of when you get to launch. And launch is when all sorts of crazy, interesting things happen. Um, it's a lot of navel-gazing in the industry where everybody's very proud of everything they've done, and most people don't actually hear about it. And you, you, know, you go home and you tell your mom, I shipped this thing, and nobody knows. You meet your old classmates. They don't get it either. <laughs> so that's roughly how the process goes. You can talk a lot more about that. It's incredibly boring, uh, but I wrote a whole book about it, so clearly I'm strange. OK. so. I thought to myself, what are those are the top three questions that I get asked? You know, one of them was, what is it that you do again? That's what my mom asks me, right? Why, why do they pay you for that? Um, and the answer is they need their cars washed. Uh, so here are, some, here are my top three questions. Uh, and actually, I may just do one. Maybe I'll do two. OK, so why is some software great and some software is lousy? My opinions on why some software is great and some software is lousy. You've all encountered this. OK, one. Somebody decided the technology went first. OK, from before, who decides what software to build? It's all the engineers and, like, and the program managers and the product managers and the geeks. So they said, wow, this is so cool. If we made it this way, it would have 29 different buttons, and it would be fantastic. And that's how you end up with software that has way too many buttons and is impossible to use. right? Um, there are rare exceptions. Uh, Intuit built a program called Quicken a while back, and they were one of the first companies that actually went out there and they sat down with users and they figured out how do users use their checkbook. And they built a thing called a register that looked exactly like your checkbook. 
It was like this amazing innovation. Oh my gosh, we should make it look like a checkbook. <laughs> it's brilliant. And that's what they did. Uh, and it worked great. Uh, uh, here's another one. Uh, I confess to being slightly biased here, but traditionally, uh, this industry has taken user experience designers who have non-traditional backgrounds, right? They traditionally did not go to engineering school. Some of them went to liberal arts schools or so forth, but they had deep user experience and empathy, and then brought them in, put them in these incredibly critical positions, and then paid them half of what everybody else was paid. Many of them were women, and so were railroaded by all like the macho you know, engineers who have no social skills. And as a result, it is nearly impossible to hire a good designer. They all work independently. Uh, and so you get into the situation where you don't actually have the right expertise. And instead, you've got people at the top saying, I know how this should go. I don't have to listen to them. That's another problem. Another issue. So this goes right back to the first one. You try to solve a technology problem. Somebody says, you know, we ought to be able to have, like, I don't know, 30 gigabytes of email. Well, let's call it 20. 20 seems good. But back in the day when you had 20 gigabytes of email, this was a big deal. And you know what happened when you had 20 gigabytes of email? It became very, 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 very hard to do things like sort by from and sender and date. And as a result, people found it really hard to use Gmail because they tried to solve a technical problem and then it compromised the user experience. Provided some interesting things at the same time. Was not a bad product by any means, but very interesting the way the repercussions worked out. And then, like most things, communication. Um, these companies move so quickly. And they are so diverse. And the folks who are hired into them are hired based on their ability to understand algorithms uh, and a very sort of narrow form of science. Not really a science that required you to write a paper, but a, a science that required you to write a very specific sort of language that isn't use some, you know, English words like print or, you know, send. And you know it looks a little bit like English, but it's really nothing at all like English. And so as a result, communication fails horribly in most of these situations. And then everybody's pushed really hard, right? Because everybody's moving so quickly and you're trying to make things happen. The communication fails. And so you know this just happens. People depend on each other and things break. Uh, let me do one more, uh, which is why are some products so late? Dependencies. Um, when you build something big and you depend on people, everybody depends on everybody else, and things get slow. The bigger the project, and anybody who's tried to do a remodel where you've had like a lot of people depending on each other and it's been in, working in parallel, it's really painful. Same thing happens in software, only it's way more complex. So dependencies are a real pain, and this is one of the things that, that really hurt Longhorn. Um, a focus on perfection. Uh, anybody heard the iPhone story in which the first iPhone was actually rejected by Steve, and they sent them back to the drawing board. This is actually true. They brought, brought an iPhone out. Steve looked at it. He said, this is not right. And they'd worked on it for like two and a half years, sent it back. Do it again. Steve was right, I think. We all, you know, I think we can see what happened. But six, eight months later, it was easily eight. And it could have been twice that time, uh, you know, if they got it right. But that slows things down. Unknown unknowns. You know what? This is still a new science. As much as you see software happening, people are trying to do new things every day. And as a result, uh, you know, we're finding out stuff and there's things we don't know. You go into a space like multi-way video, you don't actually know how you're going to get the bits from Stockholm to Korea to New York. How are you actually going to exactly make that work? Is it going to happen? I don't know. You have to figure it out. And sometimes it takes you longer than others. Finally, there's a thing, well, not finally, but maybe we'll leave it at this, oversubscription. So this is where, even though people in software are pretty generously compensated, uh, everybody's asked to do twice as much as they probably should. And that means that things get dropped by the wayside, and sometimes things fall apart. There's a really, there's an interesting book uh, that a guy wrote a while back, a guy named Poe Bronson. He wrote a book called, What Should I Do With My Life? And he tells a story about a software engineer who is in the industry and he was so stressed out and he's freaking out. He's, you know, he's like constantly up and he's depressed and his relationship with his wife is falling apart. And it's really not a beautiful story. But it goes on to a happy ending, which is that he found a new software engineering job, a software engineering job at NASA working on the space shuttle. Because it turns out that if you're gonna put somebody into space, 
you can't have a bug, right? You put somebody up in space and the system crashes, this thing is like, you know, it goes down or, you know, terrible thing. Probably doesn't, it's, it's a bad scene. You can tell how long it's been since I got that aerospace engineering degree. Long story short, there are places where people move methodically and slowly and carefully, but they are rare, as rare as the space shuttle, which is now basically obsolete. Uh, so, you know, this is one of these things where people being oversubscribed does slow things down. That's what it's called. We call it oversubscribed rather than, you know, uh, I don't know, overworked. Um, I'll skip some of the what's coming next. We could talk about this. These are my opinions on, you know, what's new in the industry. Like, things are going mobile, and I don't think there's going to be any more installed software. We're starting to get into our next operating system wars. Um, there's the near death of physical media. That's really interesting. There's a battle for your identity going on. Who is going to own it? Google, Facebook, Apple? And then I think there are scary smart systems coming along. Um, and this is one of the reasons why I work on what I work on today. So these are a few interesting things that we can talk about. I'm happy to answer anything else you've got. You're welcome to send me email. I'm just chris at scaledrecognition.com if you've got any questions at all after this. Um, and, and you, know, you don't want to actually have to talk to me in real life. It's fine. I get it. Um, you can follow me on Twitter uh, or ask me questions on Twitter, and that way I have to respond. By the way, if anybody has a problem going across the bridge on the way home tonight or something like that, you, you can tweet at the bridge, and they have to respond because it's in public. <laughs> <laughs> this is a great top tip. Um, and then I, I do keep a block. Great. Thank you. Wow.